What's going on, everybody? We're back with the Real Bodybuilding Podcast, episode number 39. And I am extremely excited to have uh, everybody's bodybuilding mentor and four time Mr. Olympia, Jay Cutler. How are you, sir? Everything is awesome. <laughs> awesome <laughs> in Vegas. As awesome as it can be. Uh, well, hey. let's address the elephant in the room right away, I guess. What's going on with uh, Corona World at where you are? Um, everything is, is silent. Vegas is shut down. Yeah. I mean, like every place else. And I think Nevada people have listened. Uh, a lot of people are out of work. And you know the influx of people. Many of them come from all over the planet to come here for events, trade events. Uh, pool season's in swing and there's no pools open. Yeah. Uh, hospitality is on a standstill right now. You oh, just heard the conversation. I mean, gyms are shut down. But the streets are bare. I'm traveling out daily to go to my office, which is very close to the strip, actually right next to Raiders Stadium. Construction is full swing here, but there's very little traffic, which is very, very strange to see because I've been here for over 18 years now. Yeah. How are things you think going to be impacted there? I mean, you guys are, are high on the service and hospitality there, and if there's nothing going on, how are these people going to survive? Like, what's going on? Uh, unemployment, um, you know, unemployment numbers are going to come out soon, but uh, I know people are getting some funding. Uh, obviously, not the revenue that they've expected coming into the season, and people also work on tips in this fee. But at least there's going to be some revenue for people. It's going to hurt a lot of people. Uh, I mentioned earlier in the conversation, I was just having a lot of people just aren't going to pay their bills. I mean, yeah. there's some relief with that kind of thing. Uh, but we're going to get through it. I mean, I'm try, trying to be as positive as possible, uh, but it's going to be a minute. I think a lot of people are, even when things do open up, are going to be a little weary about heading into heavy populated public places, never mind flying on planes. You and I, we make a living being active through you know, guest appearances, uh, being face to face with people. Although this, this is, we were just talking about, um, zoom and how yeah. important it's become yeah. and how it's going to affect the gym business moving forward with, you know, you're going to be able to, just, I mean, people are online doing a lot of things. Now they, yeah. they tra transition working from their home. They're going to realize, wow, I can actually do things from home. And we all know sometimes separating ourselves out of our normal environment like i have an office on the strip and i sit in this this is my office here at my house and yeah. you know it's only my me and my my fiance to live here but i don't have the distractions that a lot of people may have at home with children and whatever that throws them off where they need to go to an office to focus on a task yeah. uh, i have both i have you know for many different reasons but i do kind of trade time between my home office and my strip office yeah. Uh, as I'm running all my different entities and uh, sometimes it's necessary for me just, but a lot of days I don't leave the house. And I'll be honest with you, food. I, I mean, this is my life. Besides getting on a plane and heading out every single weekend, this is my busy season for the first time. And I don't remember how long I'm home for March and yeah. April and May. Are you it's enjoying crazy. Are you enjoying being home? <sighs> Yes, I am. I don't like to say that for the circumstance, but it allows me to, I'm using the time wisely for things that I have compiled for years on end. I mean, I start with the first week thinking, oh my goodness, I need to file in my office. And I actually got through that in about a week's time. I took a few hours each day yeah. and I was able to get way ahead on that. But there's a lot of projects and I think I'm able to work mobile, fortunately, because even like with my companies, uh, I have other partners, I have people that work with me. But my main thing with the supplements now is I'm shipping out of Pennsylvania. So my was there, I just secured a bigger warehouse there. Mm -hmm. And it's just easier for me to have that management and it handled the shipping end. So my goal is to basically have an online brand that never allowed me to be stuck in a place working 10 to 12 hours a day managing people where I'm kind of just working with fulfillment, but on the back end, I'm doing a lot of content, phone calls, the inventory, uh, all my ingredients and, and formulas. I mean, it's 
it's all on the phone and through uh, emails and through uh, the internet. Yeah. So it's how easier. does, so since you touched on it, how is, I know you have a lot of different businesses, but I know some of it is like t-shirts and obviously the main one now being supplements. How is that being affected by what's going on? Cause I don't know if people, I, I don't know if people are going to be buying the same amount of supplements if they're not training at the gym. You know what I mean? You know, fortunately for me, I've been in business just over a year. We celebrated a year in February with the products. Uh, and I've had great success so far and I have a very deep uh, email list yeah. and I have a lot of contact. Right. Um, so I've been very fortunate where I haven't seen a downswing. We're not breaking records. I mean, I was breaking records every month, especially yeah. as of the first of the year. So I was immediately like, man, I'd never thought after this, this week or every two weeks I was breaking, seemed like to be week to week records. Yeah. I haven't been able to do that lately, but I've looked now, I looked at my whole charting. Today is the last day of the month. I mean, we're going to close on, we're going to close the first quarter. Very, very successful, like destroyed last year's numbers, obviously. But uh, I haven't seen the big telltale is going to be April because yeah. I think people were on the, uh, on the mind they were going to be entering back in the gym mid-April because we kind of, if they were said, I don't know, you're in Canada, but, you know, obviously Trump, oh, hey, I want to be up running by uh, Easter, which is yeah. the second week of, you know, it's the 11th weekend here of April. And yeah. people had that, that thought process, okay, we'll be back in gyms, business will be back up and we won't be laid up. So buying products, stocking up, whatever else with all the different promotions we have. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately now they're limited still back at home or doing whatever workouts they're doing, whether it's outdoors activity. Uh, so I don't know, we'll have to see how, and of course the finance, right? Now people were getting paid for two weeks because they said, okay, we're going to close businesses for two weeks. Well, yeah. now it's turned into three more days. So that's six total weeks. They're going to start collecting unemployment or they're going to not have income at all. How is that going to affect the people? So only thing I'm focused on right now, I'm good. Like business, I have many different ventures and we talk about supplements. I'm in, I'm, I'm do stuff with ammo and guns and all sorts of stuff, cannabis, everything. So for me, I have a lot of different um, directions I can go fitness arena i'm trying to do my best to focus on morale of people yeah keep everyone positive keep them influenced to to stay on track don't use this as an excuse because unfortunately you're going to see a lot of depression. you're going to see a lot of people heading different directions and probably not good direction mm -hmm. as they see no like the outcome getting further and further away of a, of a solid economy or solid job or some people are going to lose their jobs i mean a lot of people are right yeah. businesses are going to go out of business yeah. but the main thing is, is we just got to do our best to keep positivity and i think that's what you've been doing posting I, i'm watching your stuff and you know us fitness people it's such a close-knit community and we have so much influence on so many people and i think that's great that allows us to be able to interact and we're we're one of those so so i hate to call celebrities but we're very uh accessible right yeah yeah, definitely. like we answer on media. I don't know any like top like some of these NFL stars or NBA guys that sit there and converse with their fans like some of us do, right? Yeah, uh, because we appreciate those people. I mean, some people. I'll be honest. I was handwriting letters to when I was nineteen, twenty years old, and they were buying the one T-shirt I had. Yeah, and now we're just we became good friends, right? And they've yeah. attended every event and. I've seen them in the business for over 20 years. Yeah. So for me, it's like, I'm so appreciative of the people around me and the positivity and, um, and just what people have been doing. The first week was a little silly with the videos and everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. People thought, okay, I'm going to do as much funny content as I can, but now it's getting like serious. Now yeah. those people are like, Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm stuck in the house and I got to come up with yeah. more things to talk about. And it's not just, you know, crazy squatting the couches and kind of stuff, you know? Exactly. So I've been doing the same thing. So we launched our company about uh, two weeks ago now, just pre-orders actually. We haven't mm -hmm. even, we haven't even shipped our first supplements. Um, so it's a little bit scary for us because we're not even out the gate yet. So we're going to try and, and do our best, but I think we're focused on doing the same thing you just talked about, which was being as positive as possible. I put up some like stuff people can do at home and things like that. I'm trying to focus my efforts that way to keep people in a positive spirit. Cause 
like you said, it could be a month, it could be two months, could be three months. And I don't think people sitting around is really a good idea. So with that being said, what are you, are, are you actually training at home or are you taking a break right now? I'm actually training all over the place. I'm training at home. Uh, I do have a lot of weights here, which I've showcased a little bit on social media. But I'll be honest, I'm more of a cardio guy, which is like, like, ooh, we don't talk about cardio. <laughs> no, no, I do, I, I do my cardio. I'm just saying, like, are, but you got to still be weight training, no? Or you don't care at this point? I'm still weight training, but I'll be honest. For the first couple of weeks, I was like, you know what, guys? Like, this is a good break. Yeah. I don't do this for a living anymore. I don't, I don't really look at myself in the mirror like I used to. Right. I mean, I don't know how you are. And I, I don't, you know, you said you weren't really competing or planning well, to view. Or... I, ha- I have it in three years. I'd like to kind of do one more show. So I still, okay, look at, so, I still look at myself in the mirror a little bit. I mean, I still see you carrying a lot of size and yeah. you know, I do carry some size, but my goal is never for the size. So I get up every morning. I do my fast cardio. The main thing that I'm focused on is watching how I, how I handle my nutrition. Okay. And that's kind of been the day one thing with me. I, you know, I work with Aceto. I work with Hani Rambot. I work with some of the best coaches. But Aceto taught me at 18 years old how to um, eat properly. He wrote me a six-meal-a-day uh, diet, and I taped it on my refrigerator, and I followed it to a T. And I was one of these guys where, you know, we, we as bodybuilders, if you say you work with a coach or you work with someone, let's say an advisor that says, okay, you need to do this, okay? Say if you're going to do 50 sets for legs I, or three, four hours of cardio a day. If I'm told that's what's going to make me the best, I will do that without any, like, I won't push back at all. Yeah. So yeah. Chris Aceto wrote those six meals, and I ate those six meals in the same exact order every single day. I never reversed the order. So it was like eggs for breakfast. Meal two was like chicken and potato. Meal three was a steak meal. Yeah. And I would follow it exactly in – when he came back and looked at me, you know, six months later, he said, holy shit, this kid's going to be Mr. Olympia, right? Yeah. So that's, you know, that was kind of the beginning of the whole thing. So what, so actually, you were, I'm kind of moving into the next thing I want to talk about was, uh, you're known as the four-time Mr. Olympia, you're known as the bodybuilder's bodybuilder, but you're known as also the ambassador of the sport. So was being an ambassador of bodybuilding one of the things you kind of set out to do? Or was it something that just came with how you presented yourself? When I started out, I picked up a book. I saw Chris Dickerson, um, who unfortunately is sick right now. I don't know if you heard that. He yeah. was in the hospital. Uh, 1982, Mr. Was it 80? I think it was the 82 winner. And I, yeah. my, my sister's boyfriend had this magazine. It was an older magazine. And I was around 12 at the time. So this was probably about 85 or so. And I saw him and I said, and I showed my brother and I said, this is how I want to look. Mm-hmm. and he's like that's crazy it's too big whatever you know I have three brothers that never really weight train before they do concrete work but yeah uh so I saw him and I said you know I always admired the physique so when I started you know getting to high school and playing sports and I worked a concrete business I developed a crazy body and I knew at 16 I bought Bob Paris's Beyond Built book from GNC at the time because that's the only place you could buy anything was at GNC in yeah. the mall and I read his book and I learned, okay, this is how I'm going to work out. But it wasn't until I joined the gym at 18 years old when I was going to college that I actually, I had a, a, like a guy show me, okay, this is the workout routine. And at first I wanted to get really big. And then I got into, you know, more about reading about things. And then I saw Sean Ray in front of a Ferrari or Lamborghini, I think in a magazine. And I said, wow, these bodybuilders are rich. And I'm like, <laughs> maybe I can make a living at this. Right. Yeah. And little do we know that's all a facade, right? Yeah. They just rent the cars and you take <laughs> yeah. pictures. But I really yeah. thought, like, I looked at bodybuilders as, like, NFL guys or yeah. NBA guys, right? That's how I thought the revenue was. And, and remember, when we saw the Mr. Olympian, it was 60000 I think, at the time for first. And then it was a hundred. That was a whole lot of money to me. Yeah, yeah. And I started training without the thought process of, oh, my goodness, I've got to be the best in the world. But – if I could ever get to that level, I could finance myself to be able to afford the gym membership and all that. And I went through working for the gym, like, you know, cleaning equipment and working for the free membership. But I wanted to be a business guy. Like I grew up in that background. I wanted to be successful because you know what was funny for what is when I started training at 18, 19, 20 in Massachusetts, Everyone around the gym and my family used to be like, you can't make money doing this. Yeah. 
and I'm so hard headed. When I met Chris Aceto, I saw how well he was doing because he was doing like his camps and he was doing his mail order. And, you know, Laura Cavell, he was married to her at the time. Yeah. And he told me, oh, this is what you need to do. You need to market yourself and this and that. And I said, can I make money? And he says, absolutely. Like he was very positive, right? Yeah. So I said, okay, if I can just make enough money to, to pursue what I, what I, was my hobby, I'm still going to go, you know, I was going to school for criminal justice, I'm going to be a cop. And I wanted to get into business. I was surrounded by business people. I was into construction and home development at the time and heating, air conditioning business. And I was doing a million different things back then. But I said, you know what? I'll do this as a hobby. I'll be able to finance a little bit, maybe if I compete and get some sponsors or whatever else and lose a wick from American Muscle started calling me when I was 19 years old and telling me, oh, you're going to be the next big thing. And I was just like floored that a guy in California noticed me. And next thing you knew, I mean, I was out in California competing. I won the tournament of champions next year, got my pro card, met Joe Weider. And he told me, hey, I'm going to pay you to be a bodybuilder. And I was like, oh, I made it, right? <laughs> but I refused the contract. I, the long story, I came back. I got more money from him. Wait, wait, wait. And the rest is kind of history. Wait a minute. That's, a, that's interesting, though. So Weider contacts you and you turn him down. I, I won the tournament of champions in 95. I'll yeah. tell you this. It was August 19th, 1995. And the one thing about me is I have a memory like an elephant. I can remember everything. Bro. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, okay. So, I, I actually know that about you because I know you remember people's names like yeah. from Expo to Expo. So, so I knew the exact date. Chris Aceto flew out there with me. I won that show. I landed my first muscle and fitness cover ever, which I'm looking at out the side of my view here. But, uh, Next thing you knew, um, I got the opportunity at the end of that week. I did a bunch of photo shoots for like Muscle Mag and whatever else. And I got to meet Joe Weider. Like Joe Weider finally called me to his office and he walked in and it, I walked in his office and I was like, oh my goodness, this is Joe Weider. This is like the guy who made Arnold, right? Mm -hmm. And the only thing he ever said to me, he took one look at me. I was in a white V-neck t-shirt. It was like a Hames t-shirt and like shorts or whatever. And he goes, who did you shoot with? And I said, I shot with Muscle Mag. And then I just shot a cover for your magazine, Muscle and Fitness at the time. And he goes, because I want to give you a contract. That's the only thing he said to me. He said, who'd you shoot with? And he says, because I want to give you a contract. And I'm thinking in my head, like, wait a minute. You don't even see what I look like. But little did I know, he already researched me. He already had seen the pictures. Um, but you know what he saw is the blonde hair. And like yeah. he was like, oh, man, I could put this guy at the time. That was when you yeah. saw the covers with the girls and the guys, right? Yeah. That's how they were doing like the muscle and fitness and flex covers. So uh, I actually said, you know, I, I do pretty well financially, Joe. And, you know, he, he threw out a number, um, which I'm not afraid to say it was actually $24,000. I was just going to ask you that. Okay. At okay. The time, because, you know, now nowadays it's – and I said, you know – I was with a, a business associate at the time who was a great mentor to me. And he said, he kind of nudged me like, no, no, that's not, that's not going to happen. You know? So I walked out of there. I said, thank you very much. Da, 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 da. I said, but I'm going to come back next year and I'm going to win the nationals and I'm going to come back. And, and basically I came back the next, I won the nationals in 96 year later, which everyone told me should have done that fall. Yeah. But I, I waited and then I won the nationals and he gave me double the money in the contract. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So it's a little, I have to go back to it because it's actually not really heard of that somebody would meet Joe Weider and turn him down. How well were you doing and what was it all from? Was it from personal training or like, where were you, how did you set yourself up to be able to turn him down? I was actually working in, um, I was doing a, a big development, a home development out in Massachusetts. And I was working, a friend of mine had a heating air conditioning business and I was just working. I mean, I wasn't making a ton of money. To be honest, I was kind of like when I walked out of there, I'm like, hey, man, like that's, an, that's two grand a month that I could have been getting right now, you know? Yeah. And uh, he's like, don't worry. You're good. Like, you're, you know, because I wanted to, I'll be honest, like I wanted the nice stuff. I had a motorcycle. I drove a piece of crap car and, and you know, I wanted to drive a, a BMW at the time. What, what were you driving then? I was driving an S10 pickup truck. It was white and it had rust all over it. <laughs> I know what those look like. <laughs> but it it only, all I cared about was getting to the gym. But remember, back then, I, I picked the best gym I could train at. So the gym that I chose was 45 minutes away. So I would drive up 45 minutes, and then I would drive back 45 minutes. So 
a lot of my day was spent driving to the gym, but I knew that was what I was pursuing was possibly, you know, going to be my career because, you know, Chris Aceto was already telling me like, Hey, you can be really good at this. And I had got enough, enough notoriety from people in California because you know how it is being in, in, you know, Canada, like we looked upon, and this is probably, you know, remember many years ago, California place, right? If you were noticed in California, like you were big time. Yeah. 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 And they were already telling me, man, you need to come out here. You need to, and I had visited there. I trained at Gold's gym and I walked in there and just the aura of Gold's gym was like, I saw Wheeler there and Cormier and Paul Dillette and all these guys. And I was like, man, like Sean Ray would train there once in a while. Um, but it was just like, I knew that's where I wanted to be. And I had already won the T nationals and whatever else. And, uh, so wait a minute. So sorry. How old were you when you first met Joe? Were you still 19 at this time? No, I was 22. Okay, so you had already won the T Nationals. I won the T Nationals against yeah. Branch Warren. He beat me in the overall. Yeah. Uh, and I hadn't competed. I said after the T Nationals, I met Ed Connors at Gold's Gym. I went out to the Mr. USA in 1993. And that's the year Cormier won. And that the lineup was amazing. They had like Paul DeMeo in there. They had Mike Francois. That's why I went, because Chris Aceto was helping Mike Francois, who was an absolute beast when he was an amateur. Yeah. Like he would smoke any amateur that's on the circuit today. Yeah. And Lee Priest was there. I went back. So I went there in July and then Ed Connors invited me to come back for Thanksgiving at the end of the year and said, come stay for a month and train. And I moved into Ed Connors house on the beach and, and Lee Priest was like the talk then. And I always mentioned anyone ever asked me who are the freakiest bodybuilders you ever seen in real life. I cannot tell you how crazy Lee Priest was. Yeah. Still to this day, he was so big. <laughs> he could barely walk. That's how big he was. Like, I know in today's era, like, we've seen the biggest guys. Yeah. Victor yeah. Richards was out, outrageous then. But yeah. Lee Priest was the biggest pound-for-pound pound guy I've ever seen. The arms and the legs. And, I mean, it was just crazy. He was only my age. I think he was around 20. Would you say – was he one of your influences, even though you're around the same age? He was one of these guys like, damn, like someone's <laughs> bigger than me. You know how, you know, you know how we used to compare yeah, like, yeah. who's that guy if, you know, when we were younger, right? And yeah. say, oh, he's 22. And like, man, I, I'm bigger than that at 22. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, I used to always yeah. compare myself to the guys that were winning team nationals. Yeah. And Priest was just out of the next level. And he was like the talk of the town. They were talking about how, you know, he was the next big thing. You know who else was coming up at that time? And you might remember because he was Canadian. Bruce yeah. Patterson. Oh, I remember Bruce Patterson. He was. Yeah, he like he was a young gun too. Yeah. But he had a short lived career, no? Yes, but he was yeah. like the young Arnold. They called him the next yeah. Arnold from, you know, Muscle Mag founded him. But uh, Lee Priest was just next level. So anyway, so I, I was, you know, I went and stayed with him for a month. And I came back and I was working and, and whatever, just um, mostly in construction stuff land development uh and i came back and won the you know i won the tournament of champions i refused the contract came back won nationals the next year against tom prince he got second to me Oval burke was third uh, dave palumbo was like fifth in that class i think that year yeah. but that was like the tightest tom prince rivalry then titus had won the usa that year yeah prince was picked to win the nationals and i came in and won that show in my class and got my pro card, and then I went back to California, did my photo shoots, and that's when Joe offered me a bigger deal. And I actually hesitated to sign again, believe it or not. <laughs> it. I waited until the show was in October, and I signed probably after the first of the year. Why? Because I tried to get more and more money out of it, because I really didn't need the money. It wasn't going to change my life. And you know, I just, I wanted to stick to my guns and I ended up signing. And then, you know, I, I didn't compete for the first year as a pro. And then I went into 98 to night, night of champions. It was New York pro what it is now. Yeah. And I ended up 11th at that show. And, you know, Joe offered me an increase then, even though I didn't do as well. And that's when he started getting on me about, listen, you've got to come to California. So we'd have put me out of Massachusetts and moved me to California, he gave me a huge pay raise. I was making six figures back then. Uh, to go to California uh, to be shot year round by the magazines. Yeah. 
Okay, at the time I was under contract with ISS, I actually was under Weider contract and I left around the 2000 Olympia and I went under contract with ISS, which you know just sold uh, for about 400 million. Oh yeah, company just sold. So I was with them for three years. And, uh, and then of course we rolled into 2001. I moved to California, my career took off 2001 and then the rest is history. I was never below second after that. Okay, so you skipped over a whole bunch of important stuff that I think guys listening uh, need to hear. So there's a couple things. Uh, because of your, for those of you who didn't know, me and Jay actually did this interview about two months ago. And I had a little bit of time goes by so fast. Yeah, we had a, I had a little bit of a technical issue, so uh, I couldn't air that uh, podcast, but we're doing it again. But I didn't know all the stuff you just told me because we didn't talk about it in the last podcast. So what I want to get to is how did you have the belief in yourself? Where did the belief in yourself come from to look Joe Weider in the face and say, nah, I don't want, you know what I mean? Like, I know you had money, but you obviously must have thought you were going to be great to be able to turn down a Joe Weider contract. So where does yeah. that, where does that belief come from? You know, I didn't, I wasn't a cocky kid, but I had good advisement around me. Uh, I mean, listen, I started, a, I started myself as a business, like right out of the gate throughout. As soon as I started making, like I started that little mail order and like selling eight by tens and t-shirts and I, I created like a, in a corporation so I looked at myself as a business from the first day I started as a bodybuilder and whatever revenue that was, I was earning to my company. Right. So, uh, you know, Joe Weider taught me a lot of things, but our relationship became really, really solid. And he was really like a father figure to me. And if there was a most influential person ever in my career it was Joe Weider. We had our indifferences. Like he threw me out of his office before. I mean, I can get into that. But for, for what? For, he what? Taught for me, what? He's the one that taught, he taught me more about real estate, but uh, he was a huge, huge mentor to me, but I respected him because I had read a lot about him and what he had done for bodybuilding. But the people around me between the, my accountants and um, my guy who kind of mentored me in the business relationship. He was very, um, he was very arrogant in business. He's like, listen, you never take the first offer. You know, he was real hard nosed about that. And like I told you, he, he nudged me like, no, you're not taking this deal. Yeah. And he even, he pushed back even when I was going to sign the second deal. And that's why I hesitated to sign months later because I wanted to get more money because I said, listen, you're going to, he told me you're going to be the best. Chris Aceto was like, you're going to be great at this. Because you know why? It was my personality and they knew I had the head for it. I always talk about the success of bodybuilders. They may have the best physiques, but you've got to have a certain headspace for it. You've got to know how to bury yourself, have that tunnel vision, keep your social, it's social distancing, what we're doing right now. Yeah. Like that's the life of a bodybuilder, right? Like when we train for shows or when we go in the gym and train, do we want to talk to anyone? Not necessarily, right? Yeah. We don't want to talk about the family problems, all those things. I was very great at distancing myself because I was an introvert. Mm -hmm. And if I told you in the beginning, uh, people never would have expected me to become the ambassador because I wasn't vocal in that sense. I kind of did my own thing. I kept my head down. I trained like a maniac and where I didn't train always heavy and extreme all the time. I trained very with a lot of intelligence. So I knew how to contract the muscle. I learned how to, you know, have the flexion of the muscles to be able to work even not under extreme loads. And I think all that combined with the sleep patterns and, and you know, the ability to kind of push things to the side and focus on one thing, it was a great advantage to me. And I was surrounded by the right people. And I remember watching LeBron James when he came out of high school. And they always said he has to surround himself by greatness in order to be great and go to what he ever became mm -hmm. and like he may fit finish as the, one of the greatest athlete if not the greatest ever right I mean they compared him to Jordan but yes. it's a matter of opinion but LeBron's done some amazing things and I think who you surround yourself with and as long as you keep like the leeches away and whatever else it's it's very you can be very very successful so we always talk about having positivity and not negativity around us because we as bodybuilders are all surrounded by you know, you go to the gym and we train and we look amazing. There's always that jerk off in the corner that says, oh, he's missing this or he's not going to yeah, yeah. do this. Or, 
someone like you being in Canada, they're like, oh, the Canada guys can't come break yeah. through and do that, right? You yeah. always yeah. had that, that lure, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's how Massachusetts was. So I knew there came a time when I had to break away from that. And I, I remember waking up in California for uh, the first day, and I moved there with my, my ex-wife. She was my girlfriend for, since I was 16 years old. Mm -hmm. And I woke up out of bed like this, like smiling, like I'm in California. The yeah. sun is out, no more snow, no more treaching to the gym and changing the shoes when you think your boots are wet or whatever. Uh, it just became a positive vibe for me. But I was all about the positivity and always, always about surrounding myself with the right people. But the mindset was the key. Yeah. I had to believe I could be great. I was surrounded by people that gave me reason. This is why you will be great because it takes a strong mind. And Chris Isito still preaches always about, takes a certain headspace for a champion bodybuilder, meaning to the Mr. Olympia level, right? Yeah. Um, and you look at the mindsets a lot of these guys, look at the Ronnie Coins, look at Dorian Yates, look at me. Like people always talk about, oh, they had crazy physique, but the mind, right? Yeah. yeah. The mind was different. Yeah. And you see so many people that we're not going to name those people, but just had it, but they couldn't focus on the one thing, right? The one thing I'll say between you, when you, you know, you mentioned Dorian and Ronnie, the one thing I could say between the three of you that is definitely a trait is when you watch Ronnie's videos or Dorian's videos or your videos, it always seems like everything's wiped away except for what they're focused on. It never seemed like they have any other turmoil. And if they do, they're able to put it aside to kind of get what they need done. So and it, it was very robotic. That's what it said. But I never said like. anything. I never, like, if you watch some of my old videos comparable to what I am now, yeah. a whole different person, right? I, w I was going to actually touch on this. So back in the day when I turned pro, uh, I think it was 2006, you are already like winning. I won that winning, year. You're winning. You won that year. That's right. So you're already at the very top. And um, back then we didn't have Instagram and Facebook and all that, but we had all the chat boards and the muscle muscle forums and all that. So that's where I would, everybody would go to talk shit and whatever and get up on the news about bodybuilding. And the main knock on you was that you weren't, there wasn't like this, you weren't oozing personality. You were very robotic, very like just focused on what you're doing and you couldn't be a good ambassador because you weren't like out there and outspoken. Mm -hmm. How did you go from that Jay to the guy making funny commercials all of a sudden? Retirement, bro. You know, retirement. <laughs> the goal yeah. becomes uh, many other things than just oh, how many chicken breasts I'll eat that day and, you know, winning the Olympic. I was the guy that won the Mr. Olympia and came off stage and everyone's smiling and happy. And I, I leaned over to whoever, my team member or my wife or whoever at the time, and I said, okay, how can I be better? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no enjoyment whatsoever to what I did. Uh, yeah. no celebration the celebration was fake the celebration was like the after party that i was paid to attend after the show it was a business yeah. move right uh but i was back training like within the week i i was one of these guys that you know remember we didn't have social a lot of times so, like social media came about after instagram started late i mean it would be totally different to, in today's world of bodybuilding but uh I would be back in the gym and I would be like, okay, I need to get better. Cause remember a lot of those times I would lose in a Coleman. Right. Yeah. And then when I won, I mean, it was controversial years. Yeah. So I was never perfect. You know, one of these things like you can win a show food and just people are like, man, Jay looked great, but there was always that, but always glutes could have been tighter or he yeah. always chest could have been a little fuller. Yeah. That's the problem with bodybuilding. And it's like, you know, when a team wins a Super Bowl or, you know, an NBA championship or whatever else, you know, World Series, it's, you don't hear as many, well, if so-and-so caught that ball or, you know, usually it's like the score, you know, it's kind of, it shows what, what the outcome was, right? Yeah, yeah. And in bodybuilding, like, they talk about, well, so-and-so missed his peak. If he would have been on the money, like, he would have, well, dude, listen the trophy sits right behind. You can see him right in my background, right? You see <laughs> yeah. Course and I was there, right? Yeah. Yeah. I wanted five, but you know, fortunately I was able to win many and, and uh, I became a different character when I stepped away from it because I realized that I carried a big weight on my shoulders and that was a spokesperson. 
Yeah. That was people looked at me and I was molded into this, uh, which was never the plan. When I started training, I never thought, oh, I want to be admired by a gazillion people. I just wanted to win, right? Yeah. We yeah. wanted to win. Yeah. And we wanted to be like the best body ever. So you kind of to overcome obstacles, yeah. but we, I never thought I would be Mr. Olympia. So when I became the Mr. Olympia and then when I stepped away and I look, I almost look up now at what I was because I'm like that here now because I'm so removed from it. Yeah. I realize now how many people were influenced by what I did selfishly. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Because we are selfish. Yeah. 100%. We are selfish. Yeah. But how and, do you, but I'm sorry, I don't, I don't want to interrupt. I just, how do you go from, I mean, you're an introvert, like you said, you very, very, and I know retirement kind of loosens you up, but when I watch your videos now, it's like a totally different person. But how was I to you when I met you for the first time? Do you remember when I met you for the first time? I think it was the Arnold classic. Was like, I cordial? Yeah, of course. A hundred percent. Yeah, no, no. I'm not, I'm not saying you weren't ever uh, a nice person or cordial or professional or any of those things. But your personality now is like yeah. fun and loose and I wish I had an explanation for it. Uh, but, but what I, I'm, what I enjoy I'm, my life a lot more now. Yeah. Which but, would be surprising for pe to people. I guess what I'm asking is, was that person always there, but you had them suppressed because you were yeah. so focused? Because I was super popular in high school. I was like oh, okay. in the in crowd, you know, and I was yeah. a party guy and I was like yeah. fun. And, and then I became a bodybuilder and I like died and became this like machine, right? Do you ever, you know what? I've thought of myself that way before because I was in high school, I would party and hang out with everybody and all that. And then it all kind of stopped. Uh, maybe not to the extent you did, but obviously it, it slowed down. But um, do you ever look back and think, what would my life have been had I not pursued bodybuilding and I had still been that fun, charismatic party guy or, you know what I mean? Like, where would I have gone with my life that way? I don't think about it, but I know I would have been successful no matter what, because my brothers are super successful. They have a thriving business. But, yeah. you know, living in Massachusetts is a lot different from living in California and Las Vegas. Uh, my whole family is still in Massachusetts and it grounded me. It taught me the work ethic is crazy. Right. Uh, but for me, um, I would, I was pursuing a degree in criminal justice. Uh, when I was growing up, I wanted to be Rocky. You know, I wanted to yeah. be Sylvester Stallone. I wanted to be Van Damme. Those are my influences. And then yeah. I saw Arnold and I never thought about being a film star, but, um, I wanted to be a bodybuilder. Right. Yeah. And, uh, I never thought about anything beyond once I became a bodybuilder, I realized that my potential was, was great. And that potential was to be a business guy. Yeah. And I wanted to be, I mean, Sean Ray was my idol, dude. I'm going to, I'm going to admit it, you know, and he'd probably be surprised to hear it. Mm -hmm. uh, but that guy was like, I followed his blueprint of like the videos and the marketing stuff. And, uh, you know, I thought, like, like I told you, I thought he was super wealthy and I always heard he was a business guy and you don't probably didn't hear as much because it was not a, you're in a different era, but yeah. Sean was a pretty smart guy and he kind of set the standard. He's very outspoken. I think he's doing a great job even now being kind of like a figurehead in the business. Yeah. But uh, I kind of looked at his group and I said, okay, how can I capitalize even more on this? And Chris Cicito was a huge mentor also with his, he was, had a crazy work ethic also. I think it's kind of like the East coast thing, but uh, I don't know really what made me become out of my shell. It, it kind of revert. Like you said, I think I reverted back to it, but I think you have to be kind of an introvert to be very successful as a bodybuilder. And a lot of people may shoot me down for that. Mm -hmm. But if you really look at the trend of all these guys, um, you know, Arnold stepped away and became a movie star. Yeah. He quit. Yeah. And he came back in pumping iron. We all know that the outcome of that was questionable, right? Yeah. Because he was already Arnold, like the Arnold that society knows. He wasn't Arnold Schwarzenegger, like the guy from Austria that came as a bodybuilder. So he, and they weren't winning the crazy amount of money and endorsed and got public appearances back then. Bodybuilding was like super cult then. Yeah. So he had to step away to be successful in other arenas. You cannot be successful in many arenas when you're trying to be the best bodybuilder in the world. So anyone that tells you like, oh, you, you can do 12 million things, you can be a movie star and then go back and win the Olympia the next year. 
it just doesn't happen like that. It's not like these other sports where they can take a side gig and they can, you know, do movies or whatever else in the off season, right? What's off season to us? Fuad? Yeah. That's just eating more and training more, right? Yeah. Because yeah. we're trying to improve. So you're, you're forced into that. And that's what the problem with the fan base didn't understand that, they respect it a lot more now because they look at what some people, the potential of so many people that have been thrown away mm -hmm. in their careers by doing so many different outside outrageous things that the introvert life is like, I hate to say it, that's kind of like what bodybuilding is, but that's what pleased me. Yeah. And I, like I said, I, I, didn't, I always say I didn't train necessarily for the money. I, I had challenges that I wanted to get through, but fortunately I was able to make a lot of money doing it too. But I didn't sit there and count the money and say, oh, I'm, I'm making this much, so this is going to make me work that much harder. I just knew that there was a final outcome that I, I wanted to be this guy. I wanted yeah. to be this guy that I am today and be a positive role model and be someone that did it the right way and got out healthy. And that's how I continue to live my life right now. But I'm as active as anyone is in the oh, business. Oh, I know. I know. So because what, I love it. Because what, I love it. One of the things you said was you can't do a bunch of things and be Mr. Olympia or be really good at bodybuilding. And I, I've always preached that myself, but you were always the guy I looked at and I was like confused by how you were so good, but you were doing so many things. Because if you look around the industry, there's only a handful of guys doing t-shirts and doing, you know, doing other business things that mm -hmm. within, the, within the sport. And you've always had like a t-shirt business, the mail order business, the you know, the traveling for weeks on end, gas posing, uh, now the supplements. I mean, well, but you were sponsored and you're traveling for supplement companies at the time. I, I own a company for a number of years. I was just in a partnership with another brand. You know, I've owned, actually been in supplements with my own brand since 2013. But that's my point is how do you do all of that at such a high rate and be so successful and still maintain your your level of success as a bodybuilder because that's what a lot of us struggle with like we're trying to make other avenues to create more wealth but a lot of people can't juggle the different things and still be great bodybuilders yeah and i was questioned about that I, you know i remember having a conversation with steve weinberger who's a very close friend of mine I promote two shows with him actually on the east coast and i remember him saying to me jay you gotta slow down man you could be so much better if you just slowed down and i remember i said steve it's you know, this is, this is the brand building, right? This is the, yeah. the future. And, and uh, he said, you know, make it while you can. Right. Yeah. And next thing you know, I retired and, you know, I continue with the success. And I remember him saying to me in one of our conversations, like, man, you did it right. Like yeah. I was wrong, you know, because granted I didn't win, you know, although 2001 could have changed the whole game for me. Uh, that buildup of the second place is really built my character and built my persona without mm -hmm. me being very vocal right yeah uh, because i let the body do the talking you know how you kind of walk the walk kind of thing yeah so i was continuous with the second places to the arguably the greatest bodybuilder of all time and you know i can talk a little bit about that too if you want um it was when ronnie retired it was kind of over for me i didn't feel like i had as much there yeah. Um, as much as I, when I got to Showtime, he was the enemy. I respected that man like more than I think anyone's ever respected a a, a nemesis. You know what I'm saying? Can Can I ask you a question? Since we're on that topic, I want to ask you something that's oh I've always wondered. So 2001 uh, was obviously very controversial, and a lot of people thought maybe that was your best look, or at least they thought that you won that show. So a lot of people that have gone to the Olympia and maybe should have won that didn't, you know, Nasser being one, you can name a bunch. Um, yeah. So those guys never seemed to come back and you just kept coming back. How did you not like, why didn't that controversial loss lead you down the wrong road? Um, you know, the funny thing about Oh one, and I'm going to tell you, like we talk, I, I can't stand when people say, Oh, well, Jay, you didn't win. Cause whenever I post up an image on Instagram, you get, the gallery of people that, man, he beat you from the back in the set. 
I never said I, sh you know, I said I should have won based on the scorecards because you know, as a bodybuilder and I know as a bodybuilder, how it judges and prejudging, correct? Yeah. I was ahead by six points after prejudging and he came back at a night show that did not count back then. The posing round did not count yeah. and he won. Yeah. So for me, it's, it's an absolute travesty that I lost that show based on the judges had me six points because it was leaked. The scorecards were leaked at that point. Yeah. So that's my problem with 2001. And then of course I failed the diuretic test, which is another whole debacle. Scam, I, didn't even, whatever. I didn't even know about that. It was just total bullshit. And then, and then, uh, you know, and then I've hired a lawyer and I sued like I sued over like the samples and everything else. And I won and kept my money or whatever, but yeah. Everyone was taking diuretics at the time. It was just, you know, there were certain band lists or whatever. So yeah. uh, I was relentless, man. And I really saw it. I saw it when I stood next to Coleman. And, and truthfully, this is the first time I ever thought I could have won the Mr. Olympia is when I stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Coleman. And I looked over at him and I saw the nervousness, right? And I said, I got this guy. You think he was actually nervous? You think he was nervous? He was nervous because, yeah. dude, he knew that. Then he knew the scores. Yeah, yeah. You know, and you know, you got to remember, two thousand one Olympia almost didn't happen because nine eleven happened on September eleventh, oh, right. and the Olympia was six weeks after. That's right. So I remember in my being in my home on September eleventh, and within two days, they put a flight restriction. Right, you couldn't fly anywhere. The planes were grounded. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember them saying Vegas is a is like under high alert for a next, next terrorist attack. They didn't know it was coming. It was yeah. more scary than what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. And we were questioned like, okay, is the Olympia going to happen? And this is, remember 2001, we didn't have big expos with it. It was a bodybuilding show. It was at Mandalay Bay. Mm -hmm. So meanwhile, we got there, Ronnie pulled the flag out in the finals. If yeah. you look at the video online, I think he, I remember that. He has the American flag trunks, remember? Yeah, yeah, and he's yeah. waving the flag, and at the time, yeah. you couldn't have props. So it's a, it's a dis you get disqualified, right? Yeah, yeah. But they, that was, the whole thing was just a disaster, and I lost. But I was so happy to be second. But for the first time, I realized, holy, I can beat this guy. Yeah. And I saw the nervousness, and I just finished what you don't realize because you guys didn't see it. The year, the fall before, after I got eighth at the Mr. Olympia, Ronnie and I went on tour, and it was him and I, no one else went that finished. I finished eighth that year, and, like, the gap between first and eighth, no one went. Yeah. So it was just him and I. So I got second him at a few shows, and I was able to actually compare myself, right? Yeah. And that's before he really made the crazy transformation. And I was pretty comparable. I was about 260 then. Yeah. And he was still, I mean, he was about, two, I think he was about 260 also. A uh, little taller than me. And then next thing you know, 2001, and I stood next to him. And then I just said, you know what? I got this guy's number. Although I didn't compete in 2002, which I feel was, the, was one of the mistakes in my career. I moved to Vegas and I was building my house. It was chaotic. Uh, he, you know, he came in smaller that year and then Gunther beat him, whatever, two weeks That's later. That's the GNC, yeah. And that was a controversial thing. He went from fifth to beating him and and whatever. And, uh, you know, I thought Ronnie was done after that. And then of course, 2003, we all hyped up to come and then Ronnie came out of the woodwork. How like, did you, how did you feel about, how did you feel about Ronnie's look in 2003? Was it when you saw it, you like, holy shit. Or backstage, I, I was confident for what I went in that show. I said, I'm going to win the Mr. Olympia. Yeah. Uh, I had already won everything that year. I went, won the Arnold, the Arnold won yeah. all the Grand Prix. I won the Ironman that year. I was the biggest thing in bodybuilding at that point, like coming up strong and I was getting better. And Coleman shows up and takes his clothes off backstage. And I just said, Oh shit. <laughs> I said, Oh shit. Really? The great Jay Cutler. You said, Oh shit, you do it. Wasn't he like 280 pounds that year? <laughs> Something so ridiculous. They say 276. They said yeah. 290, like 287, but I heard it. The real number was around 270. You know, big or bodybuilder yeah. is it yeah you no know, they we exaggerate our weights right yeah he was just outrageous yeah with that condition that was the crazy thing and you know that was the best version of ronnie coleman we ever saw yeah and we will ever see on a stage i believe package because no one's going to have that hamstring glute tie-in crazy 
the conditioning right, in the back and the peak biceps and and be symmetrical like that like they talk about Rami being like the next whatever but he's didn't doesn't have the flow that Ronnie Coleman no. had and I knew I lost um but I kept going is it but, hard is it hard to compete when you're backstage and prejudging hasn't happened yet and the guy strips down and you kind of know, is it hard to get out there and still give a hundred percent or do you just keep going anyway? Um, I still was confident that I was going to do well. You know, I remember I was still second. I think, I don't know who was third that year. I don't know if it was. Dexter. Well, those years, those years were always uh, you and was, Ronnie. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, I had seen Coleman. We did a photo shoot like, eight weeks out for Fleck. Gunter was the other, that was the other hype Gunter too, if you remember, because he won an O2, right? He beat yeah. Ronnie at the store of strength. Yep. And I remember seeing Ronnie and, and you know what the crazy part is throughout, I didn't realize what was coming in the next weeks, you know? Yeah. Because he was still pretty big. We exposed at Lonnie T show in June, which he did every year, him and I, and he was big as hell. He was probably 320, but he was heavy, you know? Yeah. yeah. And I was in better shape uh condition wise uh but he was always big you know i knew he was just a bigger guy than me yeah. and when he showed up at the olympia i was like damn that was a crazy transformation and i heard about him shooting his dvd at that time um when he that was the year he did the 800 pound squat yeah. and all that stuff yeah. and i was filming i was filming one step uh, i just finished filming one step closer so we were kind of battling off the stages too doing the dvds and those DVD sales were just extraordinary for us. Like we battled back and forth on who would sell the most DVDs and, and uh, you know, that we did that every single year and he would showcase what he did and I would showcase what I did. But, you know, I came back after 2003 and like I said, I got to get bigger, you know, and I came back to the 04 Olympia massive, you know, and I came to the Arnold small uh, controversially on that show. Cormier probably should have won. I remember uh, that show. I was at that. I was, I was watching that show. Who should have won? <laughs> well, you're on the show right now, so I can't say Chris. No, I mean, what do you think? I was smaller, I, though. I think – I thought Chris won that show, but the problem with Chris was he was never hard from the back. He always I had a – was tight, though, and good shape yeah. at that show. I thought he was – I thought the only place he was lacking was he could never get his glutes sharp. Yeah. So he always had that little bit of softness from the back, and that's probably where you got him, I think. But – yeah, I was a lot smaller, though. I was about 245 for that show, which was way I, too small. Didn't he take second to you at the Arnold's like two or three times in a row? I think he set the record. I think he has six second places or something. Yeah, he, I thought – that's right. So that was the year I thought he had you. That was the one year I'm like, you know what, I think, I think Chris beat Jay this year. But yeah. I, know you, I know you had him the previous years where he took second to you. But I thought if there was any year that he could have beat you, it was that one. Yeah, so it was controversial. And then I came back like – crazy big for the olympia i was like that's the when they had the challenge round remember they had the challenge rounds yeah stuff? yeah 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 and uh gustavo bedell moved you know he came in to his I, own in all four yeah. and five like and he yeah. won the challenge round in all four and ronnie was pissed and you know triple h was <laughs> up on the stage but yeah. i think i was about two i was about 280 for that olympia yeah so on, i went to, on on stage yeah i came oh, i was but i wasn't hard enough you know ronnie yeah. Ronnie, that's when Ronnie was like really 290. Yeah. And we were just getting ridiculous by that point. We got way too big. I mean, yeah. but we were just so much bigger than a lot of the other guys that it just, I mean, we had the advantage, right? When you look back at that, like when I look back at my own physique, I liked my physique when I was around 235, 240. When you look back at your physique, do you look back to like, say, you know, 99, 2000, 2001 and think that was where you were the best of yourself? Uh, yeah, 2099, I got 15th at the Olympia, second to last. But I had a really great body. My back wasn't as big, but as my back got bigger, my waist got wider. I had a small waist in 99. Yeah. And I had pretty damn good proportions. Yep. Um, 2000 was so, so 2001 was, I can, I can see Chris Osito's argument because remember, he helped me in, in 01 and Hani helped me in 09. And those are the two years that stand out in people's mind. Yeah. Uh, 2003 Ironman, I was pretty sharp too. But uh, I can see the argument where 01 was the best flow. Like I was two, 255 there 
And then when I was 09, when I came back and won against, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, Dexter Jackson, I was 254. Yeah. But in your so, mind, but, but in your mind, if you had to pick a physique, like a lot of people talk about judging and how they, they let the guys go too far. And that's why some of the physiques got ruined and now they're trying to kind of pull it back. Mm-hmm. And I guess, I guess what I'm asking is, if you could have set the tone for bodybuilding, is the 2001 J the way you would have stayed? Yeah, my my abs were inside out, Fuad, and to me that's bodybuilding, right? Yeah. Um, I'm not a believer in the big stomachs, and I think the big stomachs come from overeating. We talk about the drugs and everything else because we all did the same thing, and, and I'm not going to sugarcoat like what I did was any different from the other guys, right? Um, you know, you talk about the growth hormones and insulin, all that stuff, right? Um, we've all experienced, I mean, most of us have with all that stuff. And, and I can't sit there and tell you why well, I had a secret that no one else had, but I did one thing. I was a low protein eater. Okay. So I didn't okay. eat a lot of protein. My waist wasn't narrow, meaning from, I had a wide waist. I yeah. overdeveloped obliques. Yeah. Um, great midsection. Like I always had deep abs. Um, but you know, everyone's knock was, I was, my waist was wider, but I never had a gut. Like, and I, think, yeah. I think that was because number one, my structure, I have a big rib cage, but at the same time, I didn't overeat a lot of protein. Like uh, there were times when I worked with honey, I ate the most protein I ever did. But during the Chris Aceto era, he didn't have me eat a lot of protein. It was mostly carbohydrates. And I think I was able to get a little tighter working with honey, like drier, more crisp look mm-hmm. by the higher protein. But it was mostly from fish, like white fish that didn't sit in my stomach long. I think when you get these bodybuilders eating tons of chicken and red meat, because a lot of them just say, I don't want to eat fish, so I don't. Yeah. Um, you get that buildup in the intestines, and then you get that push. Uh, I never felt that, like when I was in the gym, like, hey, hold your stomach. And no one ever said to me when I was hitting my mandatories six weeks out or four weeks out or three weeks out from a show, hey, hold your belly in because it's sticking out. Yeah. I think when you get to that point, You've pushed the limit, right? And that's the that's the the issue I have. And I remember even when Sean Roden was training to come to win the Mr. Olympia in 2018, I told Chris Psycho Fitness, who was helping him with the posing on a daily basis, I said, he needs to be careful with his stomach with the transitions. And he has a super small waist, but he had distension. Yeah. And it was because he was overeating. And I think Phil Heath ran into the same issue. Phil Heath was in 2011 when he beat me. Uh, he was amazing, right? Streamlined this and that. But as Phil got bigger, unfortunately, the stomach started to push out. So he had to learn how to control that. And that's what did him in in the end. Yeah. And that comes from just trying to eat to be so much bigger. And the guys, as you get bigger, you lose that, that separation. And that's why I can't stand when people say, oh, you know, so-and-so back in the 90s the guys are so much rounder and bigger than the guys in 90. Now you can't compare the errors. Look at Dexter Jackson in 99 and compare him to what he looks like today. He's a much bigger version. You understand illusionary. He may not look at because he's standing next to guys that aren't as big Mm -hmm. where today, I mean, I mean, Levero and all those guys, they were lighter body weight. They was much more just condition and and separation, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have, we lost that separation as we got too big. And that's the downfall of bodybuilding. But once you have, you know, it's like this. You can go to a show and you say, okay, here's your top five. You've got to pick the best of that top five. But if you have a top five that are overly full, you're going to piss, pick the guy with the most detail that's his full, right? Yeah, that's right. You're not yeah. going to pick the guy that's super shredded and say, okay, that's your winner. But Because he, he's way too small. You understand? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the problem with bodybuilding. And that's where people's discrepancy is on how they judge or comment the shows. Yeah. It's what you have in front of you that we have to judge the best of that group, right? Yeah. It's kind of like uh, Dexter said in a recent interview that he did on uh, Valuetainment or whatever. He said the era of the 90s was the sucked down, flatter muscle, but shredded to the bone. Yes. Whereas the era now is more full, round. And if you're shredded, flattened out, you're not going to win. You know what's kind of funny, though? You mentioned Cormier at the Arnold, and he was second to me three yeah. times. Yeah. He yeah. never had the strided glutes, right? He, what? Yeah. So I remember that's, that's the unique thing. I competed in an era where not all the guys had the strided glutes. Yeah. Like Lonnie did, right? 
which oh, he was just next level compared to a lot of guys. But that was the guy that I was only, I was looking at Dexter's. I always thought Dexter was too small to beat me. Right. Yeah. Um, but think about that. Chris Cormier was third in the 99 Olympia. Yep. And he, you know, unfortunately had a couple of side things that kept him. He could have been like a top contender at the Mr. Olympia for many years, but he wasn't shredded. And I couldn't stand when the shredded glutes became things like it, like Phil Heath, Kai Green, like, look at these guys, Dexter, like they all had the crazy shredded glutes and someone like you or I, we have a little more problem getting that, right? Yeah. We have to really suffer to get that. But unfortunately that suffering causes the less genetically gifted hey. <laughs> bodybuilders to lose yeah. that fullness. Our fullness That's was right. our key, right? Yeah. Um, I wanted to touch on uh, work ethic in a sense of you would go to expos. One of the one of the one of the quotes I heard you say was, "I'm always the first person at the expo, and I'm always the last person to leave." And I remember that because uh, it was around the time that I turned pro that I heard you say that. And I'm like, "That's a really good thing to live by, right? To try and emulate." Where does that come from? Where does that like? How do you? You know, a lot of bodybuilders don't give a shit. When it's time to eat, they walk away. They go eat. When it's the, the doors close, the doors close. They leave. They don't care how big their line is. Where does that come from? I remember when I was coming up and I remember meeting, I don't even know who it was, but I was so disappointed the first pro bodybuilder I ever met because they just wouldn't give me the time of day, right? Yeah. Um, and I remember saying in the corner after my first interaction, and you know, you look at these people in the magazines, our only outlet at the point at that time, you say, man, like, what do I say? I don't want to sound stupid. Right. Mm -hmm. You go up and you know, there's not, you, they, you want a picture, want to buy a picture or whatever, you know how it is. Yeah. Uh, and there's no conversation or whatever. And you're like, oh, man, like, I, I didn't know what to say. And then there was no like carried yeah. conversation from the athlete. Yeah. And I always said after that interaction, I said, if I ever get famous, I'm going to do my best of my ability to make people feel like they were in a great environment even if they're super nervous and you should see people that still come up to me these days, how nervous they are. You can yeah. sense it, right? Yeah. You've seen that. Yeah. And you, you try to carry conversations. Some people it's impossible. Like, don't get me wrong. Like not every person's, I say, Hey, how's your day going? Who are you here with? Um, you know, da, 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 da. I, I just create whatever the circumstances I usually can come up with. Hey, you look pretty good. You got big arms. Like, yeah. you know, whatever, what kind of shirt is that? Like whatever yeah. you're wearing, you know? Yeah. And I always said I wanted to be that guy that would people would walk away and say, man, that was a great experience. I never wanted to be a poor experience. So I realized that if I remember standing at the Arnold Classic Expo in 1995, 96, and I was a nobody. Mm -hmm. I wasn't known. People were coming up here and there, but I was basically standing there with no line. Yeah. And I, I learned to appreciate as my line grew and grew and grew. Wait, and then, okay, wait I got to stop you. I got to stop you. How did it feel? I've been, I've been, how did it feel to have no line? That's what I just want to know before you move on. At the time, bro. I mean, I was just a fan. Okay. So I was there like all the people lining up for the pros. Like I was thinking, man, I wish I could go with Stan and Flex Wheeler's line, <laughs> you know? And even though I just, to, I, you know what I thought when I, I would exactly think that like, I wonder if Flex Miller would remember I was the kid in the gym when I was 19 and saw him at Gold's Venice at and he Gold's. came home and said, oh, you look pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Wheeler did say that to me. He was super nice to me. Yeah. And I said, I, I want to go to meet him just to say, hey, do you remember I was the guy, you know, two years ago? Because that's, I was like that person that thought, yeah. oh, they'll remember me, right? Yeah. And, uh, but I didn't know. When you don't, listen, when you don't have a line and you don't know what your experience and like, who cares? Right. But yeah. if you ever become super famous and you have a long line and then you have no line, then you're like, wow, I have no people <laughs> that want to see me anymore. Yeah. That's when you know you just be at the expo anymore. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, but the line grew and grew and grew and grew. And I said, you know what? I'm dedicated to the people. Uh, if I wasn't competing, even when I was competing, I would take time to come after the show. I'd spend all day Sunday there and I'm still that way. I don't go, go eight hours without eating anything and I was Mr. Olympia not eating for eight hours and you know how that hinders you I mean I would lose 10-15 pounds on a weekend or wherever I was I mean I remember 
canceling flights to stay because the lines were so long at supplement shops being like, Hey, I have to catch a flight tonight, but that ain't happening. I'm actually going to cancel my ticket and yeah. pay the difference to fly another day. But that's just how I was, man. I appreciate my fans. I love my fans. See, that's incredible because just you saying, like, I feel bad you saying that to me because I I'm one of the pros that's like, I got to catch a flight tonight. I'm leaving. Yeah. And now when you're talking to me about it and it's not because I'm an asshole, I just, you know, you think my flight's booked. I got to go. <clears throat> um, but when you say it to me now, I think about that's kind of your investment. Like if you look at it from the business side of things, even yeah. not, not just like taking care of the fans and respecting them, but even from the business side of things, it's an investment in your brand. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I kind of think back to how my parents were and I remember my, my dad being like, after being like little, Hey, you know, are you sure this is what you want? Like, how can you make money doing this? Or, you know, why do you spend so much time in the gym? And my mom traveled to the teen nationals with me. Like she flew down to Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, and she witnessed the whole thing. And of course my mom thought I should have won against branch Warren. You know, <laughs> she couldn't understand how that little guy beat me. You know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I remember my dad saying to me like, man, like, you're getting pretty good at this. You know, when I yeah. started being in the magazines and for landing my first muscle and fitness cover was like winning the Mr. Olympia to me. Yeah. Well, it, it time, meant a lot. It meant a lot more back then. Back then. Yeah. Today, it doesn't mean as much for people and people don't have the realization because we don't have, you know, we have social media, right? Landing the cover of muscle and fitness was like you were on every single newsstand in the, in the grocery stores and, like I was a superstar where I grew up yeah. after you know, no one ever had done that. Yeah. So my parents started seeing that and that really like made me feel really good. It merely like I put all this effort in and, and I start thinking of the blood, sweat and tears. And when I won the Mr. Olympia title, it was the same thing. So many things like you see those movies and the, it becomes really bright lights and everything. And you see flashbacks, right? Like, you saw the hours training in the gym and the, all the losses to Ronnie and this and that. And all of a sudden, like all that crosses, it just was like bright lights to me. Yeah. And I was like, man, this was my whole life goal. Since I was 18, I won at 33 was to win the Mr. Olympia. There's no better feeling than that. Yeah. Like I've, that was a lot of hours, a lot of sweat and tears and a lot of ups and downs, right? It, you, you look at, it's easy for society now to look back and they say Jay Cutler, like, you know, like he was second. They forget I was second to last the first one and I was eighth and, you know, and whatever else. It just, they don't think about those things, but uh, it was just a journey, man. And I, I had a lot of appreciation growing up around my family. We were very, we weren't well to do. A lot of people think I came from a lot of money. I did not. Uh, my dad, you know, basically, you know, my mom and him separated when I was four. And unfortunately, my mom moved to Florida. My dad raised seven kids like seven. Pretty much on his own. Yeah. So my brothers and sisters took care of me because my oldest brother is 61 now. Are you I'm the 40, I'm 40? I'm the youngest. I'm the really youngest. youngest. 46, okay. I'm 46 now. So, yeah, uh, it's just they they taught me like you have to work for what you go for and you have to be appreciative of people around you. And I would have to say, Fouad, is like the relationships I've made being that person go way further than my smart and talent that, that propelled me to that. Because people respect you when you put effort forward and you give them the time and you never know who you're coming face to face with. You know how many super successful people follow the sport of bodybuilding and you'd never imagine some of these people come to these events, became some of my business advisors or partners or... Um, I, I mean, it was crazy. I mean, I can tell you a story of Paul Gardner who owned muscle tech. Yeah. He called me when he was 22 years old and said, Hey, I'm starting this company called muscle tech. I want to sign you to a contract. But Robert Kennedy gave him my phone number. I remember exactly where I was sitting in the basement mm -hmm. in Spencer, Massachusetts. And he, he called me on, this was like, I didn't have a cell phone. How, how, how old were you? How old were you then? It's 21. Okay. So is this before Weeder or after? Before oh, this Weeder. is before. This is before I turned pro, before yeah. a tournament of champions, before any. Yeah. But Muscle Man knew of me because yeah. Robert Kennedy was a big fan of mine. Like, he's like, this kid's going to be like the next big thing. Mm -hmm. 
And he told Paul Gardner, because Paul Gardner worked at one of his stores. He ran a muscle mag or whatever. And he said, you know, I'm going to start this company called Muscle Tech and da-da-da-da-da. And he says, and the funny thing is, you know how much Paul Gardner says, I'll pay you $2,000 for the year. <laughs> and, and Joe, I think, had already offered me the two grand like a month prior or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I said, man, Joe Weider just offered me, you know, 24,000 for the year and you're offering me two. And, yeah. and, and, uh, and, you know, and Paul says, I appreciate it so much. And then next thing you know, a few months later, Paul started showing up in the ads. He was like the ab guy and, you know, yeah. the high proxy cut started. Yeah. And then eventually it went to the great Kovacs and then they were walking around like they became the biggest yeah. sports nutrition company. But I always had great respect. He was a great man to me, Paul Gardner. Like we became good friends. Eventually I signed with them. How did that contract find? How did that contract finally come about? Did you have to, um, you they, had to fought, get, they, they fought to get me for years. So I was with Weeder, and then I did ISS, and I was family with ISS. I remember was, that. Oh yeah, like they were my guys. Um, and I said I'll never leave this company, but Muscle Tech came at me with such big numbers and like such. They were like <laughs> the it company. What, back was, then. what was the first? Do you mind telling tell me what your first number contract was with them? Ah. <sighs> It was over 300 grand. <laughs> and, and remember, where, that, was, that was a long time ago, right? Well, when, when was that? What were you, where were you placing at that time? I hadn't won the Mr. Olympia yet, you know? But was it so, past the year 2000? Like, was it? Yeah, it was past 2000, yeah. Okay, okay. But at the time, remember, I, I, I was able to... I was able to secure, uh, you know, the weeder deals and the... Mu uh, muscular development deals. I remember Steve Blackman sitting with me after 2001 Olympia, him and John Romano were like running the magazine then and said, how can we get you to work with the magazine? And I said, why don't I come up with a column? And I actually wrote my columns at the time. Mm -hmm. I know, um, you know, Ron Harris ended up writing a lot of the guys columns, but I said, why don't we start a, a monthly column and I'll get paid to do that. And that's how I started with the whole, I started the whole magazine thing, which was crazy. Mm -hmm. And then Weeder came at me and they said, hey, we want to sign you too. And I had both magazines paying me <laughs> along with my supplement deals. And what I was yeah. killing it, you know. And, yeah. and, uh, and then, of course, they started signing all the guys to the magazines. Yeah, we were all living good. I don't good. know that. Yeah, we were People all living good that. back then. I was the first yeah. guy to, to do that deal and, and create that opportunity. And I remember that we, we were sitting at the Nationals and I forget where, after 2001. And that's when I was already in my, like, issue with the IFBB and over the diuretic testing and stuff. And I remember sitting there and we came up with that whole thing with the, with the, uh, you know, to do the thing for the magazine, right? The column yeah. is pretty cool. So I want to touch on a couple more things, but I don't want to keep you forever because it's been a while and I know you're okay. super, super busy, but so one of the main things uh, we've discussed before and you've touched on a couple of times was Chris being one of your mentors and mm -hmm. being your coach. Um, but what was it like switching from Chris to Hani? Because you went from you went you left Chris in two thousand nine and you went to work with Hani, and that had to have created some turmoil. Um, you know, Chris and I had worked together my whole career. We won the Olympia two thousand six. You know, two thousand seven it was controversial with Victor. Right, I had an infection that year, um, so I didn't look uh, spot on. Two thousand eight, I lost to Dexter. Uh, which I was really disappointed because I came back at night show and I think I looked better, but between 2007 being off and then coming in at eight and being off and prejudging, it was just too much for the judges. So they just said, listen, this guy's not performing. We're going to knock him off, you know? Yeah. And I had a great rapport with the judges. Everyone knows, like, you know, I, I had great relationships with Jim Mannion and Weinberger and all these guys, you know, Sandy and the crew, but you know, a champion, I mean, a champion really performs, you know, on all stages, right? Whenever they get on the stage. But uh, Chris and I conversed after 2008, and I had a lot of people around me, Fuad, that were in my ear and told me, you need to do this, you need to come in like this. And I, I kind of created a posse around me and I started to believe the hype a little bit. And looking back now, it's easier as a man to realize like the ins and outs and really what was necessary. And I just had too many eyeballs and too many opinions. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned to you earlier about, oh, I always wanted to be better. The problem was, is I was never satisfied that I was good enough. I always thought, okay, I can improve in here and there and condition this and that. And conditioning was my biggest downfall. I, I was a, a guy that tend to retain water, especially when it came to contest time, unless I really dehydrated myself. And, you know, it seemed like the diuretics was essential for me, right? 
Even yeah. though in 2006, I won the Mr. Olympia with no diuretics, um, it, which was the only time that I ever didn't use a diuretic to win a contest. But uh, when Chris and I had the conversation after, I said, you know, it just, it doesn't seem like it's working. And I think we kind of both agreed, like, you know, maybe it's time to do something else. But he didn't realize that at that point, like, I didn't go right ahead and hire Hani. Hani called me after the 2008 Olympias. Kind of like, he was kind of like, along with the nemesis of Coleman, like him and Coleman were good friends. They used to go on cruises and everything, yeah. even though Chad Nichols was helping Ronnie. Uh, and he just questioned, like, are you okay? Right? Yeah. And I thought that was really nice. We had spent, like, an Easter together back in, like, 02. Honey came to Orange County when I lived in California when I first moved there. And he came and spent Easter with me and my sister and whatever at the time. And this is way before he was married and had kids or whatever. And, you know, we got to hang out and we, we were cool, but I always felt like he was on the other team. Yeah. So when he called me and reached out to me and he said, you know, you can still win this thing, you know, and he was helping Phil at the time. Phil was third that year. And uh, I said, you know, that was really nice for him to do that and this and that. And I said, maybe if you know, wouldn't mind, I'd bounce some ideas off you. And he was starting to get the name a little bit then. Right. Cause he had yeah. been working with Phil Heath. That was like his calling card. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so not until about December, I actually called Hani. I said, listen, I want to make another run at this because I was ready to retire. I was going to quit because my, my confidence was way down at the time. And I was second guessing, okay, what was I going to do? And next thing you know, Hani said, you know, I said, well, you, you mind, you know, give me your opinion. He's like, you know, you need to improve your leg. Your leg's downsized on one side. And I had a pinched nerve and I started doing like, uh, decompression beds and this and that. It's just started with crazy therapy and getting my body back to normal. We started training. We shot FST7 stuff. Yep. Started training under Hani a little bit. Next thing you know, we just started rolling in and built it up and flex. And at the time, still social, uh, no, so, no social media. So it was just magazines. And Phil and I, you know, we teamed up and, you know, he was kind of still my guy. And next thing you know, we rolled into the Olympia and came back and shocked the world with one of the best physiques. But I think Chris we didn't really talk as much on and off. I mean, we were like family, but like, I felt kind of like a little awkward because, you know, now I came back and I won it like in crazy fashion, right? The best yeah. I've been in years. Yeah. So everyone was all on this honey kick and, you know, oh, Jay left Chris and that, 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 that. So I'm sure it wasn't, wasn't the right thing, but um, sooner or later we got to kind of come talking a little bit. And, and then eventually, um, you know, I worked with honey for nine and 10 11, I tore my bicep three weeks out, lost to Phil Heath. Mm -hmm. And then I was contemplating retirement, but I wanted to come back and compete one more healthy time. So I had Chris Aceto come back for my 13. Yeah. Um, I finished six, which was my last, which was a gift, by the way. Um, you know, I, I, I beat some guys that probably I pr probably shouldn't have, but whatever. It was, uh, it was the end of my career at that point, I decided. But Chris and I are super close. We talk almost every day. Um, honey, I actually just texted yesterday, still waiting for him to text me back, but, um, you know, we, we, I have memories with both guys, but you know, Chris was the guy that started me and I wanted to finish my career with Chris, but you know, I think honey at that point was like, Hey, why didn't you come? But at the time he had Phil Heath, it was just really all the attention was on Phil and I knew Phil was coming to his own and, and realistically, honestly, flew out in 13 when I came back, I knew I wasn't going to beat Phil Heath and it that was the first show I ever trained for that I didn't think that I could go in and blast guys, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think it was more like the show where everyone like the rodents and people are like, Oh my gosh, I'm competing against Jay Cutler. Yeah. Like I always want to stand next to this guy because the respect factor is there. Right. Yeah. Which I appreciate even more. So it was really fun Olympia for me, probably one of the, the most memorable ones I did, but it was the worst placing I'd done in yeah, 12, yeah. 13 years, you know? Um, but to this day, like I'm still close with both those guys. Um, Aceto has a lot, obviously a lot more memories because we yeah. met when we were, when I was a kid, mm -hmm. we used to train together. I mean, he was 24 when I met him. I think I was, I was, you know, uh, 19. Yeah. So I want to, about placings, it's actually important. It leads me to two questions. One, what was it like when you beat Victor and did you think you really beat Victor in 07? Cause I feel like Victor's career, kind of took a turn after that year. And he um, never, never I, I was confident I won Fuad. <laughs> and, and I questioned to compete that year because I had an affected shoulder. Mm -hmm. And I said, man, 
I know I'm not my best, but the truth is, is I think I looked good enough. And we know Victor's never really spot on, right? Oh, and yeah. certain things, that even worse condition, like the crazy legs in the midsection, like I still was good enough where I was comparable. And, and prejudging was questionable, but I still was ahead on the scorecards. And I did come back better at night. I didn't have the striated glutes. I didn't have all that. But, but Victor wasn't outrageously crazy either. Yeah. Yeah, I think so he was. I, I think he was the best Victor we had seen, but he wasn't what you're like what you're describing. Not, let's put it, he didn't blow me off the stage. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I could ask you as as a as a competitor, you've been in shows where you where there were controversial decisions. Once again, I asked you who won the show, in your opinion. If you did, you see the show. I, I don't. I mean, I saw pictures. I wasn't there. Okay. But you know, two different pictures. Did yeah, you think it's two different things. Should have, do you think he should have won that year? I don't know. It depends. What, if depends if we're talking about a normal show, if we're talking about the Olympia, and we're talking about the Olympia. And I Ooh. and you. Okay, let me ask you this: What was the consensus of what people told you? Who should have won that show? I felt like. Are we being honest with each other? Yeah, like yeah, it's of cool? course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I felt like the overall consensus was that Victor had that show. Okay. Just, but not necessarily. This is the tough part for you. It's not because he was better. It's because you were better in 06. Yes. That's the tough part, right? So it's yeah. kind of like you're being judged versus your previous year versus being judged versus Victor. Now, I'll tell you, the consensus that was around me was Victor won that show everywhere mm -hmm. I went. And that was a very hard aftermath for me. Yeah. Because I went to Australia after and I had a deal with like, you know, it's like, oh, Jay's Mr. Olympia. And then it's like, yeah, but Victor should have won, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's a shitty feeling, Fuad. So I was really like gung ho about going into 08 and like, okay, this is my shit. I'm in Vegas and da 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 da. And I don't know where Victor go in 08. Was he not in it or? I don't remember. I think he kind of fell off after but that. But he year. go to, like, I think he went away or something, maybe. Yeah. I think he ran into some problems. But remember, he won the Arnold in 07. Yeah. And then he came to the Olympia. So, like, it's really hard to win both of those. I mean, Curry did it his year. Dexter Jackson done it in 08. But yeah uh you know it, it was like it was kind of one of those things where i got to 08 and i know victor wasn't in the show it was kind of like okay this is why he didn't win right mm -hmm. that kind of thing like that's how i felt like it was kind of solidified in a sense but like I, I felt pretty shitty about um winning for the first time is that you know your what I, mean? I never your, felt that before to be honest is that your least favorite olympia win yeah that was my least favorite and, uh I, I felt really um, not good about winning, you know, because if people thought I shouldn't have won. That's a terrible feeling. Like, yeah. because I was like, I'm about pleasing the fans too. And yeah. that's why like in 08, I'm like, man, I'm going to come back. And I remember I was filming all access at the time. And then of course I lose to Dexter. And it was like, I'm almost like thankful that I lost to Dexter because if I wasn't at my best, it allowed me to come back and be crazy for nine nine and then yeah. you know as people question 10 like phil was good in 10 like he was yeah he could have, you know phil was on the rise then in 11 i mean it was clear i, I was a shadow of just because of the body well you had an injury injury's a little different but yeah. i mean i still think phil was like he was really coming into it at that point you know what i don't I, mean? I don't think the consensus in 10 was i think it was the right you know what i mean like yeah. i don't think anybody said anything in 10 i still think i was so high from nine yeah like the hype was so real yeah. That it was like, it was just like, okay, Jay's going to come. That was like an Olympia that everyone knew that I was going to come and win, right? Yeah. And then 11, it was like, that was my retirement show, which people didn't know. I was planning to step away after five victories. Yeah. Uh, um, be focused more on the business at that point. But then Phil Heath won and, you know, kind of wrenched that whole thing. So, yeah. which I was happy for him, but, you know, that started the run of his success. So the last uh, placing I want to ask you about was you were always very gracious in defeat when Ronnie kind of mm -hmm. was beating you. And I don't know if you got the same respect when you beat Ronnie. Did you notice that, care about that, or did it even register? Yeah, Ronnie wasn't happy, you know, and, and if you look at the video, like he's saying, you know, you won, you beat me, because someone had told him when we were lining up to go on stage for the top six. Oh, before you walked out. Yeah, Vicky Gates told him, like, you lost. That sucks. And he was already out of his mind, you know, because yeah. remember that was record nine. 
Yeah. That was the year he came out as like with the um the Zeus or not Zeus. Uh, yeah, it was like um Moses or Moses, whatever. Moses, that's it. And you know, they had the announcer, um, the buffer guy came and announced, you know, Ronnie Coleman <laughs> and da 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 because they had a lot of props by that time. Yeah. So it was huge because he was with BSN and they made a big deal of it, right? Um so he lost and I mean, it was chaotic, you know, Gustavo Bedell jumped on me and everyone was just like, oh my goodness, like a guy actually lost on the Olympia stage, which never happened in history. And I think people were happy for me. And I think a lot of the guys would probably be like, I wish it was me. Yeah. Um, but I think I was coming on, they, they've seen the track record of being second so many times for a guy to break through and not fall with that with that um, Rich Gaspari, Kevin Leverone, Flex Wheeler, you know, Nasser al somebody second put Sean Ray, second place finishes that should have, could have, whatever happened. Like, they were so happy for me. Sean Ray gave me, a, there's a sign on my, you know, he stole this sign. You can see it up there. It's, it's the, see, it, it's a green sign. It says, oh, yeah, yeah. Buy yeah. Back oh, there. Yeah. Sean actually, it's a street sign. And Sean came to my house after I won the Mr. Olympia and gave that to me. He said, this never, this was my destiny and you just, you have it wow. now. So I'm going to give you awesome. this. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but he, he kind of went backstage and had a fit, you know, and, and like, I didn't get to say, you know, I, for so many years he fell to the floor. Right. And he was crying and I stood there kind of like, it kind of sucks when you win, win the Olympia, um, the guy that gets second, because they say, and the winner is, and it's like home and, and then the people go, ah, and oh, I, like drown out. It's like in second place, Jay Cutler, you know, and no one hears that. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. So you're kind of standing there and then Ronnie's not getting off the floor because he's crying for whatever. And then he does a speech and I walk off the stage by that point. So I couldn't really hug him. So that's why when I did lose, you know, to all these people, like I really, even in 09, I beat Branch Warren. I held his arm up. If you go watch the video, yeah. Um, yeah. Phil Heath, I, I like gave a speech for Phil Heath. If you remember, because, you know, I've seen this guy come from zero, you know? So for me, I was, I was ecstatic no matter what, because I was, I knew what the feeling was like when you're a Mr. Olympia and whether you win or lose the person standing there, there's no other feeling like it because I know the sweat and tears and all the hard work that goes into it. I mean, can you imagine like you winning the Mr. Olympia title? Like it yeah. solidifies everything you worked for. Right. And it's kind of like you go home and you say to your parents and your family and your friends that you might've lost during that time, like your friendships that you ruined this is what I was working for. Yeah, right. Yeah. You have yeah. a standout trophy. So they get it. Like it's so elusive. Yeah. And I, I respect Ronnie Coleman. Like that guy is everything to me. Right. He's, he's, I mean, I have his book right here. He signed to my best friend, Jay Cutler, yeah. because without each other, we couldn't have been great. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if he'll ever admit it because he's, he's a little too proud, but I'm sure he'll tell you like in the end, like it was him and I were, a big, big rivalry and it was fun for us. Yeah. And he never thought he was going to lose. And I never thought I was going to lose. I truthfully thought I was going to win every show I ever went in against him. I thought it was going to be that year, mm -hmm. you know, especially after Oh two, when Ronnie came in small, yeah. I'm like, okay, this is the year Ronnie's going to come back on. I'm going to smoke him. Mm -hmm. and fortunately, you know, it took him to get a little older before I beat him. So you people on there that, constantly say you didn't beat ronnie coleman i never said i beat him at my absolute best ronnie coleman is best no one's beating him there's not in 10 years create the best guy out there and no one's beating ronnie coleman at his best that's yeah. when you can compare an error put ronnie coleman in any error no yeah. one's beating ronnie coleman you understand phil he's not beating him kai green's not beating him brandon curry's not beating him i don't care what anyone says like yeah. he's no i agree he's the greatest ever yeah um okay before you go i just want to do something real quick i'm going to share my screen with you because i have uh some photos picked out that i want you to i love that you're, you're really proud of this screen sharing thing you've been working <laughs> on. Huh? i've been watching your stuff so you've been watching my stuff really i've been keeping up with your stuff yeah <laughs> i am pretty i actually am pretty proud of it and i don't think it's going to work now one second. Let me see if I can make this work. Why do we have no luck with our analogy in, in our interviews? Oh, wait. I think I – do I got it? No, I don't got it. It says he started screen sharing. It's just uh, it's just a blank screen. So um, so you're working on the supplements pretty consistently now, huh? 
I'm actually working really hard at it. And um, okay, let me do this. I don't think that's going to work. So let me try that. We'll do something different. What's your favorite product in your line? Um, honestly, we created a, uh, a pre-workout that's like an all-in-one. It's very, very complete. And um, I dosed it as high as I could in everything. It's you know, I watched, I watched uh, the guy from A-List. Is, he does distribution in UK. Yeah. He actually mentioned your product today and looked at the formulas and said it's a bodybuilder's bodybuilding product. Yeah, I honestly, man, I, I worked really, really hard on it and I tested stuff for about uh, three or four months. So I'm, I'm extremely happy about how it came out, the flavor, everything. And I just, I'm waiting for people to try it because that's my... Uh, Gets that, pricey though when you start adding all those quality ingredients, doesn't it? It's, it's actually very, very expensive, but yeah. uh, I, it's okay. I wanted to put something out that was kind of like, you know, something a little bit, something that I wanted to use myself. All yeah. right. So I had a bunch of pictures uh, picked out, but I want you to describe some of the ones here. So where is this? 2003 iron, 270 pounds. <laughs> okay. What's okay. This is one I want to know. Talk to me about this. Who's this? This is Angie. This is my fiance. How long have you been together? Uh, it will be, it's about three and a half years now. I met her in Vegas. I'd known her for some time. Um, everyone knows I was married for most of my career with Carrie. Yeah. Um, who actually remained super close friends. She was a huge supporter, still is a huge supporter of my career. Um, uh, got divorced when I was 38 around the 2011 Olympia. And then, uh, you know, Angie came into my life uh, in 2016, end of 16, and speech actually. We were filming for JTV, and we we're oh, you know, with the sun. I love to spend a lot of time like in California. I usually marine Ray quite a bit, so uh, fun. I mean, I try to do more. She allows me to do more. Uh, she brings back the old Jay. Let's put it that way. Like instead of the the work mode Jay. It's the fun. It's a little easier to do. Yeah, we do a lot of fun stuff. You know, we were on the beach that day, which was cool. When are you getting married? Uh, we haven't set a date. We haven't okay. set a date on the wedding yet, especially not now. I mean, I know a lot of people that had wedding plans right now and it got canceled. This is the so room. I'm looking, I'm looking at that right now as we speak. On My eyes are right on that. This is, I think, every bodybuilder's biggest dream. Like, yeah, when you so, so, so these are all um, the – Bottom big panel, those are all silvers on the bottom. Okay, oh, so you down have, here, yeah. So you have one, two, three. There's there's five, right? Is there yep, five? Five, there? five. Yep. One, two, three. So you know, I have six second places. So the other one is out of the top of the screen. It's it's that pit. You Up can here. see the gold. Yeah, that's yeah. That was made for the. Those are both gold cases. That was going to be the number, the last one, number five. Okay. And that ended up being a silver. So Phil Heath has my gold on the his <laughs> trophy cabinet. Okay. <laughs> but this is what I look at every day of my achievements. And this is the only room in my home that you would ever realize who lives in this house. Do you still do you still keep, you know, the old shitty trophies you get into as an amateur, like the plastic ones? Do you they were at a friend's house. Um, actually, remember, I didn't compete that much before I turned professional. So That's right. I had my nationals trophy and like the tournament trophy. Um, but I do have pretty much every statue um, that I ever won. Um, but this is a showcase of many, many of the awards and all the covers. Like even my garage where I've been taking pictures, doing my workouts, I have a lot of covers there too. But that poster, Ronnie and I flexing the bicep, that was, that was on every bus. That was a huge poster in Times Square, New York. That was the most promoted Mr. Olympia. That was for the 2004 Olympia when they did the challenge round and it was on pay-per-view television. Yeah. And, and that was the most publicized one ever. It was at Mandalay Bay. I wanted to ask you about that. I have a photo. I had a photo on my phone that I was supposed to uh, be able to show you, but I can't. Uh, it was you, Ronnie, and, and Triple H. 
And I felt like that was something that you did not want to do with the whole. I hated like, it because remember he said that's when he said to Jay smoking crack. Remember that whole. Because <laughs> yeah. he said, "Oh, you know, I'm going to come in here." I said, "I'm going to come in here and basically kick your ass." And he's like, "Oh, you're smoking crack. You know, I'm coming in like, you know, the the missiles of Iraq or something. I don't know what it was." But I just like. mean like that. That was totally out of place for you. Yeah, to I, dude, I wasn't. You know me. I'm not going to sit up there and tell everyone what I'm going to do. I'd rather get up there and let's let's let the body do the talking. Two thousand three Iron Man, you saw that black and white. That's pretty solid. This I is seventy there. I think this is honestly the best picture of you I've ever seen. Yeah, like this is this feathering is like it's insane. Tight waist, like everything's really round. And you got no no dropping of water or anything. Sodium in. What do you um, mean? Just, what do you mean no dropping of water? What do you mean? decided three days out of that show I was going to compete in it. I was getting ready for the Arnold and Chris Cicito said, Hey, you know, see how you look. And I sent him pictures and he said, screw it, do the show. Don't do anything. Just drink and eat and whatever and go out there. And I went and won the show. Really? Yeah. Melvin Anthony was second to me there. Flex Wheeler was third. I believe that's the year came back after the kidney um, transplant. I think. Crazy. Crazy. What's this? Where is this? That was uh, that was X weeks out from the 2009 Olympia that I was sending to Hani. This is insane. Two, that was about. Two, that's when when we knew that uh, you know it was coming together like we wanted it. To. And your therapy was working because your legs are back in the same. Yeah, size. but if you notice the one leg, you know you can see the teardrop size different. Do you see the difference? This leg, yeah. That like, see the teardrop compared to the other yeah. side, it's a lot smaller. Yeah. Like that's all in my dominant. And I'll tell you what happened. In I had a football injury in high school and I casted my leg from my ankle to my hip. And it never was the same after that. And the knee never healed the same. Who uh who directs your commercials? They're I have awesome. a kid that does it. Yeah, I have a kid that shoots the commercials. Do they, really good. do they tell you how to act and what to do? Because you're awesome in them, man. I kind of write a little script, but then we kind of improvise and I try to include Angie and the dogs in, as you see with, uh, adding the protein powder. powder. <laughs> yeah. Um, and okay. The dogs. the dogs are stars. Uh, I don't, okay. You know what? I'm glad I found this. This is the last one I want to go through. I, uh, I had about six photos. There's something about you that always struck me as strange. You are extremely, well, I've heard you're extremely thrifty. And you don't seem very flashy, but you've always had awesome cars. Yeah. And that's one of the things I saw here was you're rolling up in a, in a Rolls. Great, yeah. I've always had – that's my second Rolls Royce, actually. Um, I'm huge in – like, I'm not into sports. I've had the Ferraris and all that stuff. But I, I love, like, luxury cars, Mercedes. I mean, I have a G-Wagon, too. Um, but this is this is probably my favorite car lately. Um, is the Rolls? What's the best car? This is the best your favorite car you've ever owned. I or? think so. I mean, I've always had some more sedans. I mean, I've had Porsches and all that stuff. But you know, I like luxury. I like to be like to, to be comfort. You know, that's my Mercedes. Those are your Benz, yeah, yeah. Which you know, I always customize everything. I had a lot of my cars in the SEMA show, which is the biggest car show in the world here. I've always wanted um, to go to that show. Yeah, so they used to feature all my cars in the shows. I used to do them custom for the shows, and I would feature all my vehicles in there for all my different – because I had a lot of sponsors that were dealing with the car stuff. Do you actually skateboard? I was on my longboard last <laughs> night. For that. If you watch my Instagram story right now, if you view my story, you'll see I was on my longboard last night. <laughs> so you do you do everything the motorcycles the i sold the motorcycles now i'm not riding as much um that was yesterday you'll I mean, see my story you see me on the lawn, the lawn board last <laughs> right and angie you see angie comes on she sit she's sitting on it in the next one she, she's, <laughs> she's sitting on the board and i'm riding the board so she, I'm, I'm pushing her that's hilarious cruising last night so it was pretty fun we try to get out and do some stuff now at, at night we've been watching um um ozark was it ozark oh great show I yeah can't... i never watched it up until i watched seven episodes on sunday yeah yeah i i we watched me and my wife watched the first two seasons when they were out 
the mm-hmm. third the third season just came out on Friday. Right. We finished it all Saturday by Saturday night. I just couldn't couldn't stop watching it. So yeah, it's it's great because you know Sunday I usually try to take on my days um, off. You know, and we're still pretty busy even with this um, whole thing going on with all the uh, pandemic and all that. But um, everything's good, man. It's uh, it's it's fun. I'm trying to like I said, get out and break out. Sometimes it's hard for me to forget that I'm not a professional bodybuilder anymore. And but this time I was walking this morning and I. I did a thing for JTV, actually, Dave and I did a call together, yeah. Yeah. Um, and we talked about, when this reminds me a lot, because I moved to Las Vegas in 2002, exactly this time I started building my house here, yeah. the weather reminds me of that every year when the, when the spring starts to come in Vegas, and this is going to be our first hot week in Las Vegas, it's going to be in the 80s this week, yeah. so it's just a lot of great memories, and all those memories stem from bodybuilding, like no matter all the businesses that I do, my real memories come from the bodybuilding arena. Like I just loved what I did. I loved looking back now and I can appreciate it a lot more now being on the other side. And, and I wouldn't even know how to do it anymore. Like I much respect goes out to you for stepping away and being able to get back to the stage. Like even to have that thought process, because I couldn't imagine dedicating myself once you get ready for the Olympia and you win the Olympia, there's nothing ever you could conquer that's bigger than that, in my yeah, opinion. Of course. Like, yeah. that's so much effort and so many years, right? Like, we don't have the patience. We're, we'd be dead before we could focus on another thing like that yeah. and succeed at it to that level. So um, I, I appreciate, you know, the effort for you to get back up on stage and have that ability. And it's going to be great for your brand, too. I mean, especially because mm-hmm. I know you're a hardcore guy, like, I know what bodybuilding is to you. I've heard a lot of stories about how you train and, you know, and you do train hard and you probably still love it. As long as your body still feels good, I encourage you to keep doing it. Like my, like Dexter Jackson's just amazing to me. Like, you know, for him to go get second at this past Arnold. And I I think it's just crazy. Like I see him in California. He's, he's living it. What people don't realize is he's a genetic freak, but he lives it like no one else. Yeah. Like he moves to California to train for the show. Yeah, no, crazy. I know. My body's begging me to quit if you want the truth. But I'm like, my my heart and mind, I'm like, you know, the thing is this, it's like when your last show is not your greatest show, like you say, like in uh in eleven, or was it twelve? Or eleven, when you tore the bicep. When you oh, tore the bicep, eleven, yeah. You probably didn't want to go out on that kind of note. You know what I mean? <sighs> it was so tough. seventeen, I did the Arnold's and I was sixth, but I looked my absolute worst and cause I had a quad tear like three weeks from the show. So I just don't want that to be the last show. So I don't know if, but I don't know if it's going to pan out. We'll see. Who coaches you now? John Meadows. I've been I with Meadows. Train, I get to train with John. Yeah, I know. I've seen some videos with you and him. Yeah. Too. Yeah. We get to train together. He's the only guy that can, you know what? People always ask me who the best coach is. And I feel like the best coach is always the guy that, syncs up with your mentality the best yeah it's not about like x's and o's it's more about how you talk to each other and john just knows how to calm me down when my anxiety is running too high so mm-hmm. john's always been the guy uh i worked with honey i worked with chris for a short period of time yeah. but uh john just knows how to calm me down when i'm like getting a little crazy so he's very knowledgeable i like yeah. his whole training approach i never realized because I don't follow that whole mountain dog. Like I knew who he was, but yeah. I'll be truthful. Like I don't really watch a lot of stuff now. I'll breeze through yeah. and I do your stuff's popping a lot. You know, I like Luke Sandow. I'm a big fan of his, yeah. um, but I like John's approach. Like I never realized how now I've looked into a little, like his whole theories and yeah. we see each other a lot because we sell product at Paul's um, yeah. bullfrog, you know, you were there, yeah. Paul's yeah. a friend of mine Yeah. and John, you know, I got to kind of, you know, talk to him a little bit he's a he's a super nice guy and yeah. very knowledgeable i like that you know he's very passionate about what he does he's very he preaches longevity a lot which yeah. is good which is good for guys especially as they get into their 30s or late 30s so i think that's uh, important i mean you have to you have to kind of mesh with people and that's why chris Asito and i we meshed because remember it was like the guy that kind of brought me from the beginning so it worked yeah and then honey's stuff was like okay i was already in like transition to be i was already had been great so it was kind of like, okay, let's tweak a couple of things. Um, but definitely Chris's approach was a little more on like low key. That's how yeah. I kind of liked it. Um, and, you know, I had success with both, but I can't sit there and say everyone has their niche, right? Who's yeah. better at this or that? I mean, I think 
with crazy condition, I think Connie would be a little better, but Chris Aceto knew how to get me big and bring the best package, right? Well, when I listen to your story, it's not necessarily the physical part that Chris helped you with the most. Because yeah. just when I hear your story from when he met you to help you with your businesses and getting things lined up, yeah, it's incredible, you know, that you had that kind of mentor to start out with. Yeah, it's crazy because Tani would, has no problem telling you you look like shit, right? <laughs> and, then, you know, he'd be like, you look like shit. And I'm like, well, dude, you coach me, yeah, right? right? So I always come back with that. So yeah. I was very, like, I would, like, shout back and where Chris would yeah. be like, Chris wouldn't be as, like, belligerent, like, yeah. to say, hey, you need to, you know, Chris wasn't like, you do this. He's like, dude, if you want to do it, do it. But I'm not going to make, come out there and force you to do it. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, the, the approach is a little, the stylist is a little different, but both were very beneficial to me. And I think they're both great coaches. Yeah. So it's, it's awesome. I hope to see you out there, man. Hopefully we can get back and do this thing and best of luck through, uh, through all our times right now. Yeah. You as well. You as well, Jay. I appreciate you coming on, man. Thank you for doing it. Thank you for doing it a second time. I'll get this up right away and uh, hopefully people enjoy it. But thank you for very much for the time, man. Okay, man. We'll talk soon. Okay, Jay. Thank Bye. you.